I'm thrilled to announce that The Mentor Files is back for a new season and we're digging deeper than ever before into the story behind the story. As the founder of Monica and Andy, I'm always eager to connect our community with sources of all kinds of inspiration. Join me this season as we hear from entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and experts who are all changing the game. The Mentor Files returns this fall. See you there. Welcome to Beyond the Microphone, a podcast about podcasters and the stories of how their shows came together, grew, and what they discovered along the way. I'm your host, Adam Baru. So I'd like to talk a little bit about transcripting before we get into our, our interview today. And, you know, this was interesting to me and a topic I wanted to talk about. I was recently on, you know, a, a forum, I think it was on Facebook. It was like the Buzzsprout community group, I believe. And somebody was asking why they should, like why transcripts were important, like how, how it benefits them to have, you know, to capture the transcript and to use it. And they were considering putting, making the transcript like something behind their like paywall. Um, and I, I just jumped on there and I, I kind of recommended they don't do that. Like, I think number one, just, you know, the biggest and best use of a transcript is, you know, all podcasters, first of all, should have a website. Like you should be creating a page. Like we use WordPress for EIQ Media's um, production company mm-hmm. and all of our podcasts. And it's so easy. And, you know, every episode has its own page. And I attach the transcript, which we generate, like Riverside, which we're recording on, is now generating transcripts. But we've used Mm -hmm. some other tools in the past. But, um, you know, once you have your transcript and you, you know, all that, the text content that makes Mm -hmm. up the transcript, you load that onto your episode page. And that is going to give you tremendous SEO search engine optimization benefit to your website because you know the search engines like Google and you know what have you they're constantly crawling pages and trying to determine how relevant your website will be against given keywords or search topics and you know it's going to look at you know your overall content and then compare the pages content and how much you're speaking about and reinforcing, you know, podcasting or whatever your podcast is about um, Mm -hmm. and making that a relevant page um, for people that are searching for, you know, that type of content. So, you know, that's by far the biggest and best use case for transcripts and why they're important. Again, search engine optimization for your website. But we use transcripts um, for all of the AI tools that are now available to us. Um, and the ones that, you know, the one that we use kind of starts with the transcript. We have the ability to either, you know, paste the transcript if we have it into this tool that we use, or we can just, you know, copy in the audio or video file and it'll generate the transcript out of that. Mm-hmm. Once the transcript is generated, now I can click a button that says generate show notes, generate quotes, create a LinkedIn post. And so those are done. AI, the tool that we use, basically, you know, uses AI against your transcript to compile your show notes or whatever you're trying to generate. And so, you know, if you're not making use of transcripts, um, for those that are listening here, definitely get into the practice of doing so. Again, for search engine optimization for your website, when you paste that onto an episode page, um, you know, what we do is we have basically an area where, you know, there's a link that says, you know, read transcript, and then that links to just another page on the website. So again, it's reinforcing the search, the, you know, the search engines, you know, crawling of that content to find that your page is relevant. And then secondarily, you know, for the AI tool, marketing tools that we use to generate show notes and stuff like that. So why don't we go ahead and get into our guest interview today? It's with Lucinda Sage Midgordon. She's the host of the podcast Story Power, where Lucinda and her guests discuss the stories they love. So, hi, Lucinda. Welcome to Beyond the Microphone. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So, I personally very much love the storytelling podcasts. And, I mean, you know, my favorite is The Moth, um, very well-known one. 
And, mm-hmm. you know, for me, I think the one of the best things about the storytelling podcast and really just the power of story itself is, you know, here we are in 2023. I mean, we've gone through the pandemic. Everybody's kind of, you know, lived in this isolation world for a couple of years, which now, you know, thank God we're, we're kind of out of that space. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, through that, I mean, here, one of the artifacts, which is very real to me, I run this IT consulting company. We used to have everybody here in the office. I mean, the pandemic right. forced us to go remote and then we kind of stayed remote for a number of reasons. But I don't have day to day this human connection like I used to have. And mm-hmm. one of the things that I really find fascinating with podcasting in general, but also, you know, I think it's an, uh, it's, it's an attribute of these storytelling podcasts is when I'm listening to somebody in a podcast or whatever, t- telling a story, telling their story and being mm-hmm. authentic or vulnerable or whatever, even if it's just sharing a funny experience, as a listener, I'm, I'm having a human connection. I'm not there in person. I'm not having a conversation. But you still have that. You're able to get this human connection because you're kind of part of a, you're witnessing a, an event. You're kind of part of an experience that that's happening by somebody unfolding a story, right? So right. tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about story power and, you know, how you got into that and kind of where the, the, the power of story kind of emanated within you. Well, it's a long and winding road. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, I started loving stories when I was a child. My father had dyslexia. He taught himself how to read, but he was really smart about human nature. And so he would use television and movies to help us learn how to read body language and understand why people were doing what they were doing. And so when we would watch a movie, we would discuss it. You know, he'd ask us, well, what did you think about it? Who was your favorite character? Why? Um, And then we would ask him questions. I don't understand why this thing happened or why this character did this. And so it just, he was using, he didn't realize it, but he was using the Socratic method, which is asking a series of questions to get your students to think. And Mm -hmm. so as I grew up, um, you know, I'd be the kid in the English class that everybody would kind of roll their eyes because the teacher (laughs) would ask questions and I'd say, oh, this, or maybe, maybe the character did this because of this, or, you know, and, um, eventually when I went to college, I didn't go to college until I was 22. I wanted to take a four year break, uh, from high school. And so when I went there, I, my degree was in religious studies and it was because I wanted to know those stories behind all the, you know, all the, I wanted to know the backstories behind the Bible stories, you know, Mm -hmm. and the cultures and what did they eat and how did they live and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and then, and then I added theater to that. So I have a double major BA, theater and speech and religious Mm -hmm. studies. And uh, theater actually was the place where uh, I could figure out why, you know, people do what they do, because that's what actors do. Yeah. (laughs) Actors have to, well, directors have to do it too. Everybody in the production has to, you know, analyze the story down to the minutest little detail. And so uh, then I got my master's in theater and worked in the Portland, Oregon theater scene for a while and taught little kids drama and we would write little plays to perform for their parents and, you know, mm-hmm. things like that. And, uh, and then Barry and I decided, well, we didn't want to stay in Portland too much longer. So, because it was a big city and uh, anyway... It was, I'm a highly sensitive person. It was kind of difficult living in this huge city. Okay. So, so we took, a, we sold our house and took a trip around the world. And when we came back, we decided to move to Arizona because his parents and my parents both lived in Arizona and my father had heart disease and wasn't mm. going to be around a whole lot longer maybe. And so 
Uh, the, so we moved to Arizona, and then uh, my two sisters moved here, and now we're the only ones left. Everybody else is gone. Okay. And uh, well, my father, my father died in two thousand four, um, but uh, then I started teaching public school, and I was teaching drama, mm-hmm. and I started uh, also had to teach English, which was kind of weird. Uh, Because usually it's the other way around. English teachers teach drama. Um, And then I decided I wanted to become a writer. So I started teaching at the college, theater at the college. And I was there Mm -hmm. for 14 years, just retired last August. And that last few years, I was kind of getting itchy. You know how it is when you feel a transition coming and you know there's something more to do. And I wanted to something to do when I was retired because sitting around just reading books or cleaning house, that didn't sound interesting to me at all. Well, the reading books sounds interesting, but I didn't want to do just that. And so I was writing my book and uh, I published it in 2017. And then I needed something else. And the podcast sort of just evolved. I had been listening to, it's really the only one that I listen to regularly, What Should I Read Next with Ann Bogle. And it was all, it was a great podcast. I love the podcast, but it's only about books. And like you said, something about movies and television, I think you said something about that. I like all stories. I like to hear people talking about their lives. I like to watch stories and analyze them because I, you know, I did that as a kid and read them and analyze them. Mm -hmm. I like to, I'm one of those people that after the end of the movie or the end of the book, I think now what, what's going to happen to those characters after the story's over? I always Mm. think of those kinds of things. So it was during the pandemic and I, we had to teach from home Mm -hmm. which teaching acting from home was pretty interesting um, on Zoom. And I so I I knew how to use Zoom. I already kind of knew how to use GarageBand. And so I developed StoryPower and started it in July of 2020. So I am about to celebrate my three-year anniversary here at the end of July. Congratulations. Thanks. And a lot of the people that were my students, my colleagues at the college were my first guests. And we did talk about the stories that they love, the movies that they love. I have, you know, students who go to Comic-Con regularly dressed up as their favorite characters Mm -hmm. and, you know, stuff like that. Well, after about a year, I was sort of running out of ideas of who to have on my podcast. And fortunately, I got this email from Podbatch which I call a dating service for podcasters. And I signed up with them for free and started getting requests for people to be on my podcast. And one of the guests that I had right before I signed up with Podmatch were these two women who were part of a group of women who started the Douglas Oral History Project. Douglas, Arizona is... um, one of the oldest cities in Arizona. Okay. Tombstone. Tombstone is another one. Bisbee's another one. And Bisbee had the copper mine and Douglas had the smelter. Well, in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, the m- copper mining thing went belly up. And uh, so, but, but. Most of the people who live in Douglas, their families live in Mexico or they came from Mexico. And so these women were just taking people, you know, asking them off the street, do you want to talk about your life? And, oh, I'm not very interesting. And then they sit down and they, oh, my grandfather had a store. And and when uh, Pancho Villa came through, there were, you know, there was a little battle here. And you can Mm -hmm. still see the... The gun 
uh, the bullet holes in oh, the yeah. building. You know? So uh, they didn't think their lives were interesting. And, and that's when I realized, oh, you know, every life is a library. So I try to talk to all kinds of people, mostly creatives or people who support creatives um, and uh, just find out what what's your process how did you start doing your pottery or your music mm -hmm. or you know whatever it is okay and that's yeah. that's where we are now with with story power okay so it's more process of, of storytelling um, do you mm -hmm. like do your guests come on and, and often tell their stories like or share particular stories that they've written or witnessed or mm -hmm. been a part of? Oh, I talk to a lot of authors. Yes. And so I want to know, well, what gave you the idea for that book? You know, like one of my guests was from, is from Australia. She actually was Canadian and moved, emigrated to Australia. But one of the things she discovered uh, as she was, becoming an adult was that her family was part of the Armenian Holocaust, which happened mm. during World War I. And she was just fascinated by that. It was like, nobody talks about that Holocaust. Right. So she did a bunch of research and wrote a book. And it's called My Name is Revenge. And I just read it recently. And I try to read all the books, but it takes sometimes it takes me a while to get to the book. Yeah. I've had, you know, I had another woman who is uh, an anesthesi anesthesiologist, mm -hmm. and she wrote a, a medical mystery, which is on my TBR, you know. So okay. I, I have, I've got lots and lots of authors that I talk to, but it, but I also like talking to the musicians and the visual artists too, because they're telling stories as well. Yeah. Or theater people. I've talked to um, one person that I talked to. We had a, about a three hour conversation. Editing that down was really interesting. Uh, he was from Iran. He's a filmmaker in Iran and he was about to start his master's program. And uh, I'd never talked to anybody from Iran because, you know, of the sanctions and stuff. It's hard to connect with those people. He was fascinating. So, yeah, I think, I don't know, I love hearing people's personal stories, but I also like hearing their process of creation and, mm -hmm. and what they've created because I like to tell, you know, I like to promote their work. Yeah. Okay. So let's stay. Let's stay there with the process of creation because that's actually a good segue. So going back to creating story power. I mean, you you kind of had a background, and you know, I think with you know storytelling, it it seems like kind of like a seamless transition into podcasting. But you know, what was it like for you going from concept into now reality? Like, how did you? you know, how did you know how to do guest interviews? How did you figure out like a format for your podcasts? How did you know, like equipment and editing and all that stuff? Like, how did you get started and, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, get into a groove with it? Yeah, I'm very fortunate. I have a techie husband who has been using the Mac for graphic arts and, and, and dot, 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 uh, since 1980s. And so... When I told him I want, I had this idea for a podcast, he was the one who helped me figure out, oh, I need to figure out how often I'm going to publish it. What is my format going to be? I kind of started to think maybe it was going to be sort of like, what should I read next? But I wasn't, I didn't know if I was going to suggest movies and television to my guest or have them suggest. I did in the beginning, but okay. now, now I uh, I ask the guests what they are reading or what they are watching and or if they want to suggest something, but it doesn't always happen that way. So he helped me get the little particulars about what, how was I going to record it and uh, how was I going, I went and 
did YouTube videos about editing on GarageBand because it had been a while since I'd used it. And mm-hmm. how did you use Zoom? I used, I used Zoom. I'm in the process of switching to a different place to host my podcast. It's going to be on okay. Libsyn. Um, I was, I, I have a website on WordPress and I was publishing it there, but my, uh, I don't want to upgrade. I just have a personal account. And so, um, I'm moving all of that heavy content to a different location. Uh, but yeah, he helps me do all those technical things. Uh, he, you know, we had to decide, am I going to, what kind of headphone do I want? Do I want to use a headphone or do I want to have a microphone? Mm -hmm. You know, so he helped me with all, all of that. Okay. Now, and I think you've shared a little bit about this, but, you know, looking back at some of the highlights and maybe some of the challenges that you experienced, just getting your podcast up and running. Um, and then, you know, since then, um, you know, what would you say have been some of those highlights, some of the challenges that you've run into? One of the challenges was uh, at some point, for some reason, I had a workflow about how I edited and how I um, enhanced the audio. Okay. And uh, for some reason, WordPress would not accept the way I had been doing it. And so Barry and I had to figure out a workaround. So I, I prepare it to a certain point and then he takes it and he converts it to something that WordPress will accept because I don't do the, uh, podcast, uh, block on WordPress. Mm -hmm. I just embed the audio there in the media, in the media. I just use the media to embed it. And so, uh, but now of course we won't have that problem because we'll be going to Libsyn and I'll be recording everything through there because I decided I don't want to use zoom anymore for recording, Mm -hmm. uh, the podcast. I'm going to use it for my Patreon community, but not for the podcast. Mm -hmm. So, um, we're trying to upgrade it to make it because we had, we live in the country, uh, our internet service was not very great, and sometimes it would, you know, uh, cut out, and I'd have to ask the person to re-say what they had said, yeah. or I'd have to f- fix it. So now we have better internet, thank heaven, and it's much faster and stronger, and so, yeah, I'm ready to Good. move on to a more robust hosting. Okay. So... You know, wrapping up here, um, I'm going to ask you kind of like a two-parter question um, okay. as we close. So what discoveries have you made just about podcasting? Like how is your thinking or, you know, you mentioned your own workflow, like evolved over time, um, you know, through the through your podcasting journey? Hmm. I publish my podcast every other week. Uh, and so I, I don't really do the editing and, and all of that way ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it might be better if I did do that, if I, you know, scheduled it a couple of weeks ahead, maybe. I only schedule it a few days ahead to, pu- to publish at a okay. certain time. Um, yeah. What else have I learned? I've learned that I really have to rely more on my husband than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a, um, I think they call it, I'm a technology immigrant. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I don't know all the ins and outs of how things work. And he does because he's read all the books and he listens to all the podcasts. And, you know, um, and he loves that. I mean, he loves knowing the deep how things work. In fact, the other day he was kind of getting on me about that. And I said, honey, I, I'm not interested in knowing all that <laughs> stuff. I figure out a workaround for myself. And he goes, oh, okay, yeah, I, I kind of get that. So, yeah. Did I answer your question to you? Is yeah, yeah. Funny? It was more just kind of, yeah, just about discoveries. So it sounds like, you know, one of the discoveries was just learning how to 
become a team with your husband, how to maybe divide and conquer, mm-hmm. and, and you guys are both involved in it. So that's that's mm-hmm. fun to hear about. So so last question, last part of the you know on the theme of discoveries, um, what have you discovered about yourself through your podcasting experience? I think I I have discovered that I'm like Walt Whitman says, I'm curious, not judgmental. I like to hear people's stories. I've always actually really liked that. Um, I learned it, actually, I learned it from my dad. He was always curious about people. And so podcasting is a great way to just listen to people talk about their lives and their stories and their projects. And I just want to know. I just I want to know what they're up to. You know, meet and meet them and some, you know, meeting them online is a little different than meeting them in person. But since I'm an introvert, I don't mind being home and being quiet and then coming and meeting them on the computer screen. And uh, I keep in contact. There are certain ones that I keep in contact with. And mm-hmm. yeah. So, right, well, Thank you for meeting me here today on our podcast. It's been a pleasure to speak with you and find out, you know, about your own storytelling journey, how you got into creating story power. So thank you so much for your time and for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. You got it. Lucinda has been a story lover since a young child. Her passion forged by stories and memories with her family. Her father taught her how to find the deeper layers of the story. This love prompted her to pursue a double major, BA in Religious Studies and Theater and Speech, and an MA in Theater Arts, and finally an MA in Education, so she could share, so she could share her love of stories with her students. Now completely retired, Lucinda writes her weekly blog, Sage Woman Chronicles, and is working on her second novel. She manages her online course, Saving the World One Story at a Time, and produces the bi-weekly podcast, Story Power. Beyond the Microphone is sponsored by Podtask. Whether you're just starting out in podcasting or you've been at this a while and are looking to save time so you can create amazing content for your listeners, go check out Podtask, a podcast management and marketing platform designed by podcasters for podcasters. With Podtask's automated workflow and AI-based marketing tools, you'll save time and sanity and be better equipped to grow your podcasts. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next time on Beyond the Microphone. Beyond the Microphone is produced and distributed by EIQ Media Group, LLC. Elevate your emotional IQ with podcasts and content focused on entrepreneurship, overcoming adversity, stories of emotional courage, women's health, aging, and more.